So, how was break? Who got to relax? Not as many of you as I had hoped for. Oh, sorry then. <laughs> uh, let's see. We've had a week to forget things. So, we have uh, covered chapters 13 and 14 on fluids, liquids and gases. And now we're going to, well, we, we, at the end of Friday, but you know, getting going more, shifting to electrostatics and, and electric current. We're going to see the more of the flow of charges now. Uh, so chapters 22 we started. We'll uh, do more today. And chapter 23 uh, the rest of the week. Uh, so if you haven't looked ahead, that means you'll have homework due on both of those chapters that you started before break or had access to. Uh, we'll be due Sunday. We'll review in a week for an exam on all that stuff next Wednesday. Not this Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So you have a week and a half. Um, uh, no, Wednesday. Yeah, week and a half from now. So on the 30th. So that'll be 13 and 14, gases, liquids and gases, and 22 and 23, electrostatics and charges and current. Yep, we're, we're over the hump. Uh, your, I uh, read all your superhero paper ideas, uh, where, where you guys are thinking, and I'm excited. I always like this part. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading them. Uh, those, let's see, your, your draft for your peer review, again, can be t done anytime, but you have until April 1st, so uh, through this month to accomplish that. And then we'll just have one more unit left. That's it. Seems so close now. Now that we're in the long haul, we don't have any real breaks anymore, do we? All right. I also, oh, yes. The test for the final unit, though, it will cover Well, the, we're, getting, we're in exam three. We're coming up to exam three. We'll have a final unit in exam four, and that'll just be that stuff. The final, though, the final final, will be comprehensive and include everything this semester. How many resources? I am not putting a number on it. Okay. What you feel like accurately uh, gets you what you need. Uh, now, if you need a number, uh, I would think only having one might not be sufficient. But maybe. <laughs> uh, you use this class and me as one resource. You can use the textbook as another resource. Um, and then, of course, websites. You can interview people, the books you've read, anything. Basically, you, you know, if, if you got some idea in your head and you know you got that from somewhere, then just throw it in as one and cite it. If it's all in your head and you know all that, then you don't need as many sources, and so be it. I judge more by the, the reading and how, oh, wait, whoa, this doesn't sound like him <laughs> or her. But does that help? Yeah. Most people end up with a half a dozen-ish. I've seen some with 20. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I put an announcement just today on WebAssign under the announcement section about those of you that still have unass unassigned um, clicker ID numbers. I sent an email out, well, it was over a month ago now, I'm sure, and I heard back from one person who didn't reply back to me with my question. Uh, point is, if uh, you're not well, there's two reasons you wouldn't be seeing your clicker points on Canvas. One, uh, you have an inactive license, and you're aware of that. It, it won't let us integrate back to Canvas and let it show. Um, but I can still see your points. And the ones I'm talking about, an unassigned ID number, I'm getting responses from somebody, but I don't know who it is. So you won't get credit for any of the clicker points if that's one of your numbers. 
and I see from responses that these people are still attending class periodically. <laughs> so check those numbers out in the announcements and web assign. If that's one of you and you want credit, uh, we're going to have to work something out because I don't know who you are yet. So I'll just let you, let you know about that. All right. Well, let's get charged up. We uh, started charges. They're from protons and electrons. Protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. And when you uh, separate different materials, we had uh, some fur and rubber a week ago. When they separate the materials, the atoms, some of them like to grab more electrons, in that case the rubber. So this one gave them up. So this becomes net positive. We say it's positively charged. It still has negative charges. It's made up of protons and electrons, but they're not balanced anymore. If they were balanced, it'd be neutral. This grabbed some of the electrons and became negative, this, leaving this positive. I like doing it this way. Pull this piece of tape off, and lo and behold, it gets charged. How do you know? Because it has some long-range sticky force. Right? No. No. There's a Coulomb force. That's the, the electric force between charges. There's charges in my hand, and this got charged. Why did it get charged? Because it separated from the roll, and it grabbed more electrons or gave them up. We don't actually know, but we can at least tell it's charged because it's attracted to me. So if I do a second one, let me just set that there. That one should get uh, charged up. Oh, yep. And from symmetry, you know, we did it the same way. I assume this has the same charge as the first one. So if I bring these two pieces of tape together, what do you expect them to do to each other? Repel, push away, I'm hearing a force between them. Let's see. And indeed they do. They're pushing away from each other because they're the same charge. They're still attracted to me. A lot. <laughs> But they repel each other. Yeah, like charges repel. Now, here's a trick you can do. I fold the end down so I can get it up. Put it on your table. Do this one and piggyback them. Put them on top of each other. Press them together. In theory, I'm neutralizing them. If it was missing charges, they transferred to it from me or vice versa. So now, is it attracted to me? No. We, we've neutralized it. They're balanced again. But now I'm going to separate these two. One of them should have taken more electrons than the other. Let's see. This is attracted to me. Yep, it got charged. And this one got charged. But one should have grabbed more electrons than the other, and now they attract. Because they're oppositely charged. This is fun, because anybody can do this. You guys got tape at home, right? But that's the Coulomb force. It's this force that these charges exert on these charges. And these charges exert that force on these charges. There's a mutual force. Remember, all forces come in pairs. Whose law is this? Newton. Newton, yeah. Which number? He remembers. Three, yes. You, you can't have a force without interacting with something. And these t charges are interacting with each other. All right. These two ping pong balls, I'm going to charge them up. Let's rotate that a little. So I would say they're neutral. They have positive and negative charges, but nothing fun's happening. Just gravity's pulling down on them. So I'm going to um, rub them with this fur, separate some charges in theory. They should get charged up the same way because they're being the same material being rubbed with hair, and now you can see that they separate from each other. They're the same charge, and they repel. There's a force on each one, and this is the Coulomb force. I'm going to write that down for you. Guess. Get back to that. So this is the Coulomb force.
Coulomb is a scientist's last name, if you hadn't guessed. I, I usually like doing a little E for charge, or you can, electron, you can do a Q. Q is often a lowercase Q, for, well, a big case Q for that matter too, for charges. And it is proportional, I'll do it that way. It's proportional, as you'd think, to the charge. If you have more charge, there'd be a stronger attraction or repulsion. And all forces are come in pairs. There's an interaction. So it's proportional to both charges. There's two charges. You can change either one or both. The charge is also proportional to the distance between the charges. And what do you think? If you, if you bring the charges closer together, what do you think happens to the force? Gets stronger. If you get farther away from it, you're influenced less by it. It gets weaker. So that one, it's inversely proportional. 1 over uh, d. That's the distance between the charges. So you have a charge here and a charge there. D. So that's how they, they got this law, Coulomb's force. And it is Q1 times Q2 over D. But they found out similarly to acceleration and gravity and the time there, it wasn't directly direct nah. It wasn't linearly proportional to distance, inversely proportional distance. It's by distance squared. And we've seen that before. In what formula? Or you had to worry about that square term. Had something to do with energy. There you go. Yeah, you remember? Yeah, one half times mass times velocity squared. That was the kinetic energy. So similarly, we have the same game here. If you double the velocity of something, what happens to the kinetic energy of that particle? If you double its speed, what happens to its kinetic energy? I'm just trying to gauge if it's just Monday after spring break. You don't actually know, or you're just not saying. Because you know, you'll need that for the final. You know, I was hoping that's one you pick up. Yeah, velocity squared. So raise your hand if this is confusing. Yeah, you double it. And if you triple the velocity, the kinetic energy will be nine times as much. It'll take nine times as much work to stop you. Yeah, I'll write it on the board, too, instead of just saying it. Glad you asked. One half mv squared. That's our relationship. So if you triple this, you go three times as fast, it'll take three squared, nine times as much energy to stop you. Because you have nine times as much energy. So a similar game happens with Coulomb's horse as you change that distance. If you pull two charges, so they're now three times as far apart, what happens to the force? It's nine times less. Yeah, three squared. But it's inversely proportional to the distance. As you get farther away, the force decreases. Now, this is exactly equal. They throw in a constant here. But we don't need to know what it is. It's, it's, it's proportional to what we just said, but there is a constant in there. But that's the equation that guides our thinking to this force between charges. Hopefully, you guys should be familiar with force by now. The only difference with uh, this force, it can be attractive or repulsive. Now, gravity is always attraction. You know, two masses just don't start repelling each other. Well, maybe when you're dating, but not here. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, the spinning, the centripetal force. That force, it's always attractive. Yeah, because it's actually an inward seeking force, centripetal. It's always uh, into the, the point where, about which it's rotating, the centripetal force. 
Uh, we, again, we didn't cover it. Some people often say centrifugal force, which is a pseudo fake force. It's because you're changing reference frames. You remember when we, I showed that video? And if you're in that reference frame, it seems like something's pushing you out. It, it's as if you're like being thrown out. You know that if you're in a tilt a whirl, it feels like you, you go outwards. Well, actually, the force that's keeping you in and making you go in a circle is the car door or the string. You, let, you remove that, and your inertia keeps you going in a straight line. But if in that reference frame, we feel like it's an outward force. Good question. So again, I, I want to emphasize Newton's third law. If you have two charges, how does the force Q2 feels do to Q1 compare to the force Q1 feels do to the charge Q2? So all that. Yeah, they're exactly the same. They're part of the interaction. So let's say I replace Q2 with 10 times as much charge. How much force does it feel now? 10 times more. But what happens to Q1? Does its force change? The exact same. So it feels an increase of 10 times also. It, people get, get confused by that. If you, make, if you put 10 times as much charge over here, well, that affects the force this feels. But it also affects the force this feels, because it's the interaction between charges. I don't want you guys have to miss that. And then that squared term for distance. That's going to define the next two chapters. Why charges do what they do and how we can move them through circuits and whatnot. Questions? Yeah. Here we go. Oh, they still have some charge on them. So basically, I'm... Uh, putting charge on each ping pong ball. It's lots of charge. It's not just like one electron or something, but the idea is there, think of each of those as a Q. There's a certain amount of charge on one ball and another certain amount of charge on another. In theory, they're symmetric in this point, but they don't have to be. There could be 10 times more over here than here, but notice they swing the same because the force that's pushing this ball out is that Coulomb force. What force is it overcoming? If you have a, a ping pong ball like this, there's a force pushing it out. Well, here we'll. This one feels a force that way, and this one feels a force that way. You have the string holding it up, so you have a tension and a tension. What other force am I missing? Gravity. Gravity. They each have a weight, mg, so a force down. And there's our force body diagram. Basically, we just added another force, a type of force, an electric force. And these get pushed out. So this uh, Coulomb force is helping support its weight a little bit. It's not all from the string anymore. And you know, the, the force between charges, this Coulomb force, is actually relatively huge compared to the force of gravity between two masses. Is there a gravitational attraction between these two spheres? Yes, they have mass, just like us and the Earth, but these two. But it's not very big. It's puny. This Coulomb force, electric force, is huge. It's because of this constant. Makes it a really big value. And it, it dominates, it overwhelms. It, does that help? The tape was another. You had charge on one, charge on another, they repel. It is about 9 billion is its value. <laughs> <laughs> yes? They do. And we kind of saw that already. Where does the charge go, you think? 
they lose their charge, they eventually kind of go back down. That means they become neutral eventually, but where does that, you know, let's say they're negative. They have an excess of electrons. Where do those electrons go then? They must be going into the air. The moisture, hu relative humidity. We're more fortunate in Utah. Some other colleagues, these electrostatic demonstrations don't work that well because they try to charge something up like this and the charge leaks off because it has a conductive path through water. Water is a conductor. And some of the charge can escape that way, leaving those neutral again. Let's talk about conductors and insulators. Let's charge up, this is called an electroscope. It has a little needle that can pivot. If I charge up this uh, rubber rod, I can transfer charge to it through conduction, physical contact. So whatever charges were on here, an excess of electrons, I let them move onto here. Now this is metal. Met most metals are conductors. And so those uh, electrons are free to move around. They repel each other. They want to get as far away from each other as they can. Some move onto the needle. And can you see the needle repelled by the, the stand? That shows you that there's charge on here. If I bring a, condu a conductor, this piece of metal, and touch it, where do those electrons go? Into the conductor, then? Then into me, and then? Into the ground. You know, the earth acts as a big uh, charge sink where they can all go. So yeah, I'm conductive too. Put some more charge on there again. How about this piece of plastic? What do you think? Conductor or insulator? See, you guys are geniuses. So insulators don't let electrons move freely, or charges in, in general move freely on them. By the way, this rubber is an insulator. If I touch it, it doesn't conduct those electrons away. So I actually see a lot of instructors do this. All right, discharged it through me. I see a lot of uh, instructors do this. They get charge on here and they go like this. Boop. Hey, wait, it didn't work. Or it didn't work as well. And they think something went wrong. Well, the only amount of charge that could have conducted onto there was where I touched. The charges over here aren't free to move along. So when I'm like this, they can't move and conduct through the insulating rubber. That's why I have to kind of scrape them off, if you will, make more contact. What do you think wood is? Conductor? Hmm. It is conducting, but not very well. It depends on the dryness of the wood and the moisture content, or if there's a bunch of oil or grease on the outside. Wood itself, dry wood, isn't a very good conductor. So you can insulate yourself with it. But do you want to trust your life to it? I wouldn't. <laughs> but it's better than nothing. So back to metal. All right. Let's, uh, let's charge this up differently. That was charging by conduction, physical contact. The charges actually can transfer from one to another. Let's start with, before we charge it and help you understand it, let's blow up a balloon. How many have rubbed a balloon on your hair before? Your hair stands up. So that's similar to the rod and hair here. So I'm going to charge this up. All right. Is this charged right now? What do you think? Does it have charges? Yeah. They're probably mostly in balance, neutral. So I'm going to rub it like we did with the uh, rods. Right, that should be enough. Now we've separated charges. This should have some net charge on it. What do you think the door is? Positive or negative or neutral? Good, neutral. But it has positive and negatives in it. What's happening? Why is it attracted to a neutral door? 
it has electrons. Let's say the, the balloon, which I believe it is, is negative. It's charged negative. It grabbed electrons from the uh, fur. So what are, the, what are the balloon's electrons doing to the door's electrons? Repelling. And they kind of shift the centers of the charges in the door. They kind of move away. So they're farther away, a larger distance between the charges. And there's less, less force between them. What is, just a second, Glenn, are, are the extra electrons in the balloon doing to the positive charges in the door? A little closer, attracting. So we say the door is polarized. It's a term you'll need to know, polarized. We, we, we're charging this door. We, it's still neutral. Its charges are still in balance. It's not charged. But we've polarized the charges it does have. And they've shifted, rearranged. And that's allowing the balloon to stay stuck to it. Yeah, Glenn? Ah, good. So at some point, you'd expect this to fall? I would, too. Uh, you said the electrons would diffuse into the door. Is the balloon, you think, a conductor or insulator? Insulator. insulator. How about the door? Poor. Yeah, poor conductor, somewhere in the middle. So they, they both don't conduct very well. So the charges that are on the balloon aren't really like easily moving to the door and moving around. The ones in direct contact could be, but just, just right there. So we're not losing much charge that way. But eventually, I think all of you would agree this would fall. Where do the charges go? Probably into the, yeah, the moisture in the door a little bit, and the moisture in the air even more, actually. Yeah. See how long it lasts? So that's a polarization. Let's do it another way. Here's a 2 by 4 I'm going to balance it. And let's charge this rubber rod back up. Same idea. This, this is the balloon. This is charged. The 2 by 4 is not. But if I bring it near it, with, but not touching, it attracts. So the negative charges in the rod are attracting the positive charges in the 2 by 4. Let's try the other way. And back we go. So we've polarized the 2 by 4. It's not charged. It's still neutral. But we've shifted them when I'm nearby. Now, in case you want to try this at home, you know, not all of you have these, but you have a balloon, you can try that, rub it on your hair. Maybe you have a pink lawn ornament and an oven bag. That works. You separate them, kind of like the tape. The flamingo should get charged. And let's see if that will polarize the 2 by 4 enough. Yep, sure enough. And you can attract it. It's a strong coulombic force between the charges in the flamingo and the charges in the 2 by 4. Again, if you shift, rearrange the charges so when they're polarized, the distance is closer to the opposite charges, and that attractive force is now larger than the repulsive force, which are farther away. So there's a net force. You still have attraction to the, to the same charges, but you have repulsion to the Scratch that. Repulsion of the same charges, attraction of the opposite charges, but that force is now not balanced. Does that make sense? You with me? So watch this. Let's charge up this electroscope without even touching it with the charges. So this was conduction, physical contact. That one should make sense. Discharge it. Those excess electrons are going through me to ground. Now I'm going to bring the charge near the metal, but I'm not going to touch it. Can you see it influenced? We've polarized the charges in the conductor. You can polarize charges in conductors just as well as you can in insulators. It's actually a little easier because these charges are free to move more than these. Like that. 
So if this is negative, it, you can think of it as I'm pushing the, the electrons in the metal away, and the positive charges are attracted. Now watch. Without touching the charge, I'm going to touch the electroscope. You ready? Down here. Doink. Those charges came off through me. I got rid of them. They left. Now I'm going to remove. And there's still charge on the electroscope. I never touched it with this charge. So how did that get charged? <coughs> Through the air like magic. I know. It seems like it. Because I didn't actually physically touch it with this. Let me show you an animation, and I think this will help. I found this. I used to try to draw this, and that would work, but... <coughs> Let's start with this one. Is it up? Yep. So here's a charged rod. It's negative. Bring it near uh, this ball. Is this ball charged? Good. You can see they're in balance. You get the same number of positives as negatives. Now watch this. We'll have to repeat it. We're going to bring the negative rod near it. Looks, look what happens to the charges in the ball. It's reset. As it gets closer and closer, I wish I could pause this, but I can't. The charges in the yellow ball rearrange. See how they get polarized before we make contact. One more time. The positives are attracted and the negatives are, are gone away. Because it's attracted, that difference in force, you can see the yellow ball actually gets attracted to the rod. It comes to it, and they actually touch. And once they touch, now some of the charges on the rod can move to the ball through conduction. Now, is the ball charged? And it's negative. Well, the rod's still negative, so they repel each other, and you can see it move away. One more time. So it polarized and attracted, Charges transfer, and now they repel, because they're the same charge. Does that make sense? You with me so far, then? Let's do another one. Let's expand here. Let's do this one first. If you move this rod near a paper clip, watch what happens to the charges in the paper clip. As it gets closer and closer and closer, that's kind of what happens. Within each atom... It's not like all the electrons run to one side ah! and all the left leave the protons. Atoms don't work that way. The electrons are usually, most of them are contained in the atom, but they can rearrange and kind of shift. You know, the electrons go over here and the positives over there. Or the electron spends more time on this side of the atom than it does over there. So how can we charge by induction? Here it is. We have two spheres here and the rod. The rod comes in. We'll reset. As it comes in, it polarizes these charges. That's what it did on the electroscope. We saw the electroscope get polarized and the needle deflect. As the rod comes closer, watch this left one, they shift. Now this second one is like my finger. Here's a, a conductive sphere that comes in and touches the first sphere. It gives those charges a place to go. Watch what happens to the charges on this one. They get polarized, but they have a path, and so they shift over to here. That was me. They went into the ground. So that left this first one, that's this electroscope, with less negative charges. So this sphere got charged up as what? What charge is this now? Positive. Yes. Ah, the B to A. That's an excellent observation question. That's a thinking person's question. So yeah, why don't the positives here get attracted? Technically, they do. So very good. Uh, I can think of two reasons, though, why they don't bother showing it. One, they're relatively much farther away. And it's off a distance. And just being three times farther away, you feel a nine times less the force. So the force those positives feel is significantly less than the negatives. That's one reason. Second reason, positive charges are from protons in atoms, and atoms are usually fixed. 
pretty fixed in, in metals, conductors, where the electrons can, are freer to move around. So technically, they would shift a little, but not significant. And they, so they don't bother showing it here, but very good observation. Let's do it one more time. Rod comes in, polarize the first one. If they have a conductive path, they can leave. Leaving the first sphere with less of those negative charges, and it, it's now net positive. Let's show that with this electroscope. Let's do it again. So charge the negative rod up negatively, bring it near, and we polarize the electroscope. Negative charges are shifted to that side. Bring in my conductor here, touch this side, and those excess electrons that got pushed over there have a path that left to ground. Now if I remove this influencing rod, they redistribute, but there's less electrons overall. This should be positive, right? Let's see if we can tell. Let's bring the negative rod near it. Negatives and positives should attract, so the needle should attract to it. Yes. Let's do the opposite to really convince ourselves. If you were here on Friday before break, silk and glass, the glass becomes positive. It actually gives up electrons, and the silk becomes negative. So we're going to charge this rod up positively. If that's positive, they should repel. And sure enough, it gets further away. So yes, that got charged up oppositely as it did before. So note, this is called charging by induction. We're inducing a charge on this without actually physically being in con contact. So that's two ways to charge something up. They are in your book, and you will need to know those. So you can make physical contact and just let them conduct right onto it. Or you can get near something, not actually touch it with the charges, discharge it with something else, and cause it to be charged by induction. And it actually gets charged up oppositely as it would as if you touched it directly. You sure you followed? All right. Now, you can shield charges. It's kind of fun. Uh, radio waves are coming to us. You can pick up a radio station. We haven't gotten to it yet, but there's electromagnetic radiation. In this world of Wi-Fi, it's all over the place, right? You got your cell phone. There's the, well, it's hidden behind the uh, screen right now, the, the router, Bluetooth. Pick up your radio. It's an electro magnetic wave. It has an electric portion to it that's vi changing. Basically, it it's a influences charges, and it makes charges move up and down this antenna if this uh, electric field in the wave can get to the antenna. Well, if you take a conductor, like this uh, screened cage, you can actually shield the antenna from the waves. They can't get to it. Basically, the electromagnetic radio wave gets to this conductor, and it makes the charges on the, on the cage, the conductive uh, uh, mesh, it influences those. And they spread themselves out to shield any of that influence from getting inside. There's no electric field, we call it, inside the cage. If it can get in, it will. It's kind of fun like this, too. It's not completely shielded. I can act like an antenna. I'm partly conductive, so I'm picking up the electromagnetic waves. I can just get in there. I'm not even touching the antenna. If I touch it, it's even better. How many of you lose reception when you go in a, well, in my area for one, a basement or an elevator? Basically, you're shielding yourself from these charges. And they, they can't get anywhere. There's still charges. 
There's a nice picture in your book. You know, say you have this conductive sphere. If you, cl if you climb inside, there might be charges out here. But they, they spread out because they like to repel each other. And we're close to this one, so we should feel an influence by that one. We do, actually, from that charge. We feel an influence from that one, too. And that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. Let's say, though, uh, just for argument's sake, we're negative. What will be the influence from that charge, and in what direction? Yeah, it will repel us. Well, how about this one? It will repel us. And this one will repel us. The bottom line is all these charges do exert forces on us, but they essentially all cancel each other out because they push in different directions when you're inside and you're shielded like this. And so, yeah, whoops, the radio wave put, charges this cage up, but the charges over here have an effect but they're essentially canceled by the charges over here. And so inside a conductive cage, there's no electric field. You don't feel the influence of this force from these charges. An example, how many of you have heard that you could uh, be in your car, get struck by lightning, and survive? Anybody heard that? Do you believe it? Let's see, what, let's, let's reason with physics now. You're in a car, a big metal conductor. Most people think, oh, you're safe because you're on insulating rubber tires. And it's more because you're inside a big metal cage. And yeah, charges will get deposited onto the car a lot. <laughs> but they distribute themselves because they repel and spread out through the conductor. They're free to move. And the charges all effectively cancel each other out inside the car. So as long as you're inside the car, you should be safe. If your hand was outside when it struck, nope, then you're fried. Or if your leg's outside touching the ground, path to the ground, nope, you might get fried. I wouldn't try that. <laughs> but inside, you're okay. Just like the radio station inside or your cell phone inside a elevator. Cool, huh? Uh, where are we at? Let's see. So we got conductors, insulators, charging by conduction and induction. You know what it means to polarize some. See, the door is still polarized. We haven't lost a significant amount of charge at all over there. The Coulomb force describes it. Uh, and we started talking about this electric field. Let's do that some more. What is this electric field I've been mentioning? Basically, it's like you have a charge. Let's say that's a proton. Basically, this can influence any other charge that's near it. If you bring another charge near it, there'll be an interaction. Newton's third law. And at what force will that charge feel? Boom, we know what it is now. So let's say we have a little test charge over here, a test charge. And by, by definition, we make the test charge always positive. So what will happen to that charge if we place it near this proton? It will repel. So it feels a force in that direction. Good. What if we put it over here? It will feel a force this way. How about here? Point in which direction the force will be. Good. And how will that force compare to the other two I just drew? Much bigger. Because it's, yeah, it's roughly about a third. I didn't plan this. So it should be like nine times bigger. So an elect we, we imagine this electric field, this force field, if you will. Where did I put that? The, this force field that fills up space around charges. And if you were to draw lines, these go away from the positive charge, like this, radially away. And they point outward, because that's the direction they would make a, 
positive test charge go? If you had an electron and you bring in your test charge, what happens? Yeah, it's attracted. You have a force this way. So for an electron, the electric field is towards. It's always inwards towards negative charges. What if you had a capacitor? I haven't told you what one is yet, but let's say you have these two parallel plates. And let's say you have a bunch of positive charge on this one and negative charge on this one. Which way will the electric field lines go? If, you, if, if, if you're always stumped to go, I don't know, take your positive test charge and put it somewhere. What if you put it right here? Now you ought to know which way it's going to go. To the right. It's repelled from these and attracted to those. So yeah, the field lines go that way. And you establish this imaginary electric force field in between. For that matter though, what if you have the charge up here? It's repelled by that. It's attracted by that. It'll go that way. You kind of get this field line that ends up curving. You can basically draw little point charges wherever you want. And you'd actually find electric fields like that. These together. If you brought a proton and an electron together, you'd have an electric field between them. And this one would go away, but attract to this. Away, attract to this. You get the idea? You can draw these field lines. So they always start on positive charges, go away from them, and end on negative charges. And they're useful. A couple reasons. They tell you which way the force is, and you can imagine what's going to happen between them. The closer the field lines are together, too, right here, the spacing, that's where the electric field's stronger. Should make sense. If you take a positive test charge and go right here, the force is huge. But what if your test charge's way out here? The electric field is less. So it's this construct to help us talk about other stuff you probably figured out. So the electric field tells us how the particle is going to move. It's that force per charge. And just to end with, if you rearrange that, you get that. This analogy stuns me every time I do it. Mass times acceleration, or acceleration is force over mass. If we wanted to accelerate some particle, you had to exert a force on it. How much force will it feel? It depends on its mass. What force will this feel? It depends on how much charge it is. Coulomb's law. I like to think of this electric field as accelerating these particles. It'll tell you how fast it's going, in a sense. Force is mass times acceleration. This electric force is, what are we dealing with? Charges now, not masses, but we're worried about the charges and how it's going to move. The electric field tells us how it's going to move. So th these are identical in a sense. But the electric field is just the force per charge of something. Even if you have a lot of charge or little charge, it'll tell you what's going to happen. Questions? We can do more with the electric field now that we're all on the same wavelength. All right. That's a good place to stop. <laughs>